And Thursday afternoon, to you, 4 o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Thanks for joining us. Hope uh, your afternoon is going well. Uh, Deshaun Watson in town, uh, taking a little break from the rehab. Um, he's in town for the grand opening of Lefty's Cheesesteak in Cleveland Heights. Um, Watson, a part owner of that, and he talked about how his rehab has been progressing. Uh, it's, it's very, very good. You know, the process is, you know, day to day, and we just got to take it one step at a time. We can't do anything too crazy. We can't jump uh, the gun and, and try to do too much. The biggest thing right now through this process is uh, load management and just continue to, you know, find ways to just get better and just stay on that course. So, um, you know, I'm trusting all the, the doctors, the PT, Dr. Elitrosh, and his team out in L.A. with the Cleveland Browns, and um, we just, you know, follow their role, and, you know, we'll be ready for we want. Definitely, I'll be better. Um, than, than I was before in week one. So, you know, I'm very confident in, in the roles of the doctors. Um, you know, like I said before, Dr. Elitrosh and his team um, following their lead and uh, just all the research that I've done and then just my work and preparation. You know, I put the, my whole life in, into this. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure I come back even better than before. Let's welcome in Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage. So, Quincy, the, the Browns have been, um, they've had their medical team making sure that um, they, along the way for the rehab, Dr. Elitrosh, uh, top shoulder guy in the country, um, ha has been there as well, making sure that rehab is on schedule. So um, Deshaun Watson seems confident he'll be ready for week one, and, and you can be sure they won't rush it. Yeah, I mean, I, this sounds like something that he'll be back for even by, like, OTAs, right, like in a couple of months. Now, he might not be full go, but he still might be able to participate in whatever full go is during OTAs. Um, you know, I expect him to be able to throw during training camp. That's what it looks like the the timeline has always been for him. So it's good to see that everything's going as planned. Yeah, and, and the Browns have um, have made it known that they're – you know, their team has been working with them in that rehab as well. Um, so Watson was also asked uh, about the addition of wide receiver Jerry Judy today. Yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing. I knew kind of since I pretty much got traded, that was uh, an opportunity um, that A.B. wanted to try to, you know, get done. And it took a little minute, but uh, he got it done. And I think he's going to be a great addition with Amari and Elijah. And, I mean, those three guys already been together this offseason. Uh, very similar types of guys from the same similar area. So it's going to be fun to be able to, you know, toss the ball around to those guys. And again, trying to give him the weapons to run the type of offense that, that fits him. Yeah, just give him the weapons that he needs. I mean, this is something that it sounds like Jerry Judy might have been in the original pitch meeting for Deshaun Watson, the way he talks about it. Um, and yeah, it's just trying to get pieces around him, wide receivers he feels like he could be productive with. Um, and receivers that they feel like they could be productive with him at quarterback. And, you know, you want to be able to build an explosive um, you know, downfield striking type offense, and you got to get the wide receivers, get the horses to do that, and that's what they've done this offseason. All right, so it's time for uh, the comedy section of Sports for CLE. This is wide receiver rankings from Pro Football Network. Um, they go Justin Jefferson, one, Tyreek Hill, two, CD Lamb, three. Got no issues with that. They go Terry McLaurin, 14, Calvin Ridley, 23. Michael Pittman, 24, Tank Dell, 25, Chris Olave, 26. <laughs> they rank Amari Cooper, 27. He's definitely overrated, and, the, and most of the NFL's top cornerbacks aren't scared of him. But the numbers are the numbers. Cooper has posted 1,000 yards in five of the last six seasons, including the last two for the Browns. There's some quit in him. What? But... We're also talking about a receiver who racked up 265 yards in week 15 with Flacco. Such is the Amari Cooper experience. So they're already like backpedaling at their ranking of him as 27th. I, I, this, if you're telling me there's 26 receivers better than Amari Cooper, I'm sitting there telling you, you're not really – either you don't like the Browns or you don't like Amari Cooper. That's the only way well, I can come up – that's the only thing I can come up with with this. Yeah, well, if you want to tell me that there's 26 wide receivers better than Amari Cooper, okay, then tell me why. 
right? Like that that's the issue that I have with the whole thing is like, you know, it brings me back to college when I was being taught about how to write about these kind of things. It was like, hey, you got to have a reason to say what you say and back it up. And there's nothing to back it up. He says Amari Cooper's overrated. What does he provide to prove that? Nothing but more of his feelings on Amari Cooper, right? He actually brings up more evidence that Amari Cooper is not overrated than he does evidence that Amari Cooper is overrated. So and how can I take that seriously, right? Like it does, it's not a serious article. It's not written by somebody that should be taken seriously, or at least that piece of work that they put out there, they should think about doing stuff like that because it makes it hard to people take you serious when yeah, look, you want to make the argument amari cooper's the 27 best wide receiver in the nfl make an argument but don't just put him at 27 <laughs> say he's overrated say he has some quit in him and then not not follow that up with anything other than numbers that justify why he probably should be higher than where you ranked him it it is i'm shocked that got through an editor to be honest with you it, it, uh... A thousand if there is yards in five of the last six seasons. That's pretty good. I, and I, I don't get he has quit in him. I, okay, he's played injured. He's played through painful injuries. You got to explain injury. an allegation like that, right? If you say he has some quit, yeah. what do you mean yeah. by that? Because Amari Cooper's played through more injuries yeah. than anybody on the Cleveland Browns. He played through core sports, uh, core, core muscle surgery, injury, core muscle year. injury, and in, in, and played through heel injuries. So, I, I okay, all right, on to on to. That's garbage. He's not the twenty-six. If that's all you got, you ain't got enough. So um, we'll, we'll move on. Do you think they extend Amari Cooper soon? It sure sounds like the Browns want to. Price has to be right. I'm really interested to see where the Browns and Amari Cooper are on this, right? Because I'm pretty sure Amari Cooper is going to want to get the most out of his value. Um, but he also realizes that he's at an age where that's going to be a little bit more difficult, right? Like he's going to be hitting free agency next year at 30, which not the greatest year. So for him – it wouldn't make sense to sign a contract now because I think the Browns would be a little bit less hesitant to give you 22, 23, $24 million a year than they would be if you're asking for that up until you're 34 versus up until you're like 32. So um, a lot of things are lining up for this to happen. If the Browns are willing to do it, if it makes sense for them in their situation, they will. Um, but we'll see because Amari has been – Outside of what that one guy thinks, Amari has been one of the most pivotal pieces to the Cleveland Browns since he's arrived here. And honestly, he's been the best receiver since the Browns have come back since 99, hands down. One of the best receivers in franchise history. Right. <laughs> like, and, so, and, it, it's insane. And all he does is go out and, and put up numbers and doesn't create any drama, which uh, you want to see what most wide receivers do. Look at Stefan Diggs. That's – well. That's all I got. And I would say this with Amari Cooper, too. He's put up that production over the last couple of years, which this guy left out of his article, with six different starting quarterbacks, right. which is pretty impressive, right? Jacoby Brissett, Deshaun Watson, DTR, Joe Flacco, Jeff Driscoll was thrown in there one game, P.J. Walker. like He's gotten this production with multiple guys at the quarterback position and not the consistency that he thought he was getting once they traded for Deshaun Watson. And – We've seen what he does when Deshaun Watson is healthy, right? He's put up numbers with him as well. So, yeah, Amari Cooper, one of the better wide receivers in the NFL, um, definitely a number one receiver um, and definitely not overrated in my opinion and the Browns should try to consider no, getting back. Yeah, you know, Pro Football Network's got to do better uh, than that without question. Uh, Quincy Carrier, untitled, unfiltered Browns coverage and I going to step aside, take a quick time out. Voicemail of truth and reason when we return. Stay with us. Maximum Millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery. And you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again.
We continue talking Browns with Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage. Let's head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Hello, Dave. This is Gary from North Canton. Several months ago, Deshaun Watson was on a podcast telling the guys that he doesn't play well in the first quarter because of the scripted plays don't allow for him to freelance or be creative. What are your guys think about that? And what should Kevin Stefanski do in order to free up Deshaun Watson so he can be more creative in the first quarter? Thanks. As always, appreciate all of the voicemails. I, Quincy, I, I don't know that, I think he said he wasn't a fan of it. I don't think he said he wasn't effective because of um, the scripted plays. Um, I, you got you to gotta do something they got to come to an understanding. There's going to be some scripted plays, but I think if you give Deshaun Watson some freedom to adjust, that probably answers the concerns that he has. Yeah, the whole scripted plays thing, I mean, like, it's like nobody – it feels like the further and further away we get from it, I think the less people have watched the actual clip. The question he was asked that prompted this whole thing was, hey, what's one thing you need to get more comfortable in? And he said, look, I'm not the most comfortable in scripted plays. That means it's an area he's acknowledging that he needs to get better at, right? He's not going to never run scripted plays. It is what it is. I think his issues with the offense haven't been the scripted plays. I think it's been kind of the structure and how he's asked to see things post-snap more than anything. So, yeah, I think, you know, the scripted plays, he's going to get better at that. He There's going to be times where he's going to have to stay on schedule, on script, in order for the Browns to win a game. Um, and there's going to be times where he's going to be asked to kind of break the schedule and make a play when the Browns need something to happen. I think both things are going to be important. I think he understands that as well. Um, you know, and the like, with any job, we all have things that we might not be the most comfortable in, but we understand that we got to do that in order for the job to get done. And I think that's a similar place where Deshaun Watson is with the whole script that plays thing. Yeah, the, the other thing is he's really good at recognizing stuff. I mean, if, if you watched one of his strengths in Texas was he kind of knew and would adjust at the line of scrimmage. And I would expect Kevin Stefanski and Ken Dorsey to, to play to that strength because – if you recognize a, a weakness in a defense, go attack it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go attack it. And sometimes that weakness can be, hey, they're playing far back off me. I can run. Like it was in Baltimore, right? I didn't have to throw deep. I could just run on them. They're not really covering it. Okay, cool. We're going to take advantage of that. Sometimes it might be something more structural based where it's like, hey, the way that they're keying off on this route, I'm going to take advantage of just keep throwing this out to David and Joku because there's nothing that they're adjusting to do to do that. There's going to be multiple ways to attack an off, I mean, a defense throughout the years, and, I mean, throughout the uh, year. And I think that's going to be important for him to have all of those things accessible to him. I think people feel like Deshaun, like, can't run scripted plays. And I think that's no. where it's getting out of hand because it's like he can run scripted plays. He's just more comfortable in those game changing type scenarios, but he understands he needs to do both to be successful. Yeah, I think what he's saying is there are times where he recognizes some things that the defense mm -hmm. is trying to do, and he just wants the freedom to be able to get out of it and, and attack. And, and listen, Kevin Stefanski, if he's anything, he's open to that. I mean, he's going to, they're going to build this offense around him, uh, is, is, I firmly believe that. I think. I think they were going to do that last year. And then monsoon week one, Nick Chubb gets hurt, plays well against the Titans. Then Deshaun gets hurt. And, man, it got away. It, it snowballed from there. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and you were just all excited to see Deshaun Watson just get more consecutive games as a starter at Cleveland Browns. I mean, he only had six uh, is his longest streak. So hopefully we can get more of that, see what he actually can bring to the table. And when he is allowed to kind of just cook, what can he cook? You know, so it's definitely something we're interested to see. All right. Uh, this is an NFL executive on the Jerry Judy contract extension. This is from The Athletic. Um, I agree with their theory about getting ahead of the receiving market, which is going to take off, but I'm not sure Judy is the guy to make the theory work. They're thinking, shoot, Justin Jefferson is about to get paid. Chase is about to get paid. But Judy's not in that class, so who cares about the comps? This is basically what the Giants did with Daniel Jones. No, it's not. But th what they're thinking is <laughs> if the top end of the receiving market blows up, the middle part of the receiving market is going up. Jerry Judy is a young guy. If he has a big year, 
he's going to, that market, that price is going up. I, again, it, it, equating it to Daniel Jones is just, that's ridiculous. But yeah, I think this is a, oh, my bad. No, 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 you go. Go ahead. I think this is a symptom of like, okay, sure, you, you think that he's in that second class of wide receivers, but it's not thinking about how the market works in practice. Those first level guys, the guys that are going to get $30, 35000000 million a year, they're often traded for and then extended. They don't hit free agency outright, which means the Jerry Judys are the ones who hit the free agency at the top of their class and do get that kind of money explain Calvin Ridley to me, right? Nobody was talking about, like, I don't think Calvin Ridley's better than Amari Cooper, but he's going to get paid more than Amari Cooper, right? Um, So, yeah, it doesn't really matter if he's not in that class or not. He's in the class that would get paid, and the Browns feel good about their bet that they're making there. I understand why people would be hesitant on it. The body of work wasn't the greatest coming out of Denver, but to act like he is being paid to be a top receiver when the money is very clearly wide receiver number two, like 30 to 60 num- uh, money for a wide receiver. Like, that's the thing. It's like, you want to talk about him not being in that class of wide receiver. We'll talk about that contract not being in that class of wide receiver. You know, it's like, it, it seems like they're making things pop up when it's convenient and ignoring details when it's not. It's just, it's just like, okay, just tell me you don't like Jerry Judy. Man. <laughs> yeah. It, and the other thing is, if Jerry Judy goes out and does what Andrew Berry and the Browns think he's going to do, they weren't going to get him for that. He was going to make 23, 24, 25 million. If he goes out and has uh, 1,100, 1,200 yards receiving and 10 touchdowns, that's going to that's going to blow that price up. And you have to pay him a certain level so that his agent signs a learn- longer term contract. It's not like you can give yeah. him nothing and say, "Hey, sign this contract for four years." Yeah, it's a calculated risk. Hey, they're going to pay him like a high tier two. Um, he's been a pretty regular tier two his whole career. So they're hoping that this situation um, and getting out of that environment in Denver makes him better. And if that does, then they hit on that bet. And if it doesn't, then they're not really overpaying that much. I've never seen a player get $17 million get discussed this much. Like it is so odd yeah. to me. Like we're, we're almost talking about this contract. Like it's the Deshaun Watson contract. And even that contract has a lot of conversation points that end up being nothing burgers. Like it, the, the whole contract stuff, it's like, okay, well, they can manage it, right? Like if we can manage Deshaun Watson's $230 million number to sign Jerry Judy at $17 million, then they can probably manage Jerry Judy's contract. Yeah, and he's not even one of the top eight uh, now in terms of quarterback pay per year. So keep that in mind as well. All right, this is another one. NFL executive, same article, on the Jameis Winston signing. You could have gotten more game manager type like Gardner Minshew and played to the strength of your defense, or you could say, shoot, we've got good weapons outside. We have Njoku, Jerry Judy, Amari Cooper, Elijah Moore. Let's go ahead and sling it all over the yard with Jameis, the ultimate double agent. All right, here's the thing about Minshew. Minshew signed... $25 $25 million for two years with the Raiders. Jameis is one year at $4 million with incentives that could make it $8 million, a little bit more than $8 million. Those two contracts are not similar. And Jameis Winston has a higher upside than Gardner Minshew. I'm going to tell you this right now. If Gardner Minshew, if the Browns signed Gardner Minshew and he had to start 10 games for the Cleveland Browns, we don't have the same expectations, okay? <laughs> like, or, or Jameis Winston. It, why? Why are we talking about backup quarterbacks so much? Like, if obviously, if Jameis Winston has to go out there and play a ton, it's not going to be as good as having your starter out there. It was the same thing last year, right? Um, now, as far as, like, his assessment of, of Jameis Winston, look, I would love to know what executive this is. It's always hilarious when, like, anonymous executives come out there because some of them, like, you know, you might not take them seriously if you actually knew who they were, right? Because this was the Carolina Panthers GM talk about what Andrew Barry doing. I would be like, well, I trust Andrew, right? And that's the thing. 
I think Andrew's one of the better GMs in the NFL. I think he's proven that over the last four years that he deserves the benefit of the doubt. So when it comes to an anonymous executive criticizing what Andrew Barry has done or is doing right now, I tend to give Andrew Barry the benefit of the doubt. Like, criticisms are always valid, but, you know, Andrew's earned the benefit of the doubt, especially amongst his peers. And if that peer disagrees with him, well, you know, I'm happy we have Andrew and we don't have anonymous GM as our executive. All right. Um, I, I know you've addressed this in, on your show. Do you think Ken Dorsey is already underrated? Yeah, it's the biggest thing that the Browns did all offseason, and it's the least talked about thing that we, we've discussed. Like, we were like, yeah, he's going to change the offense. Okay, let's talk about Jerry Judy and Jameis Winston's contract. Like, it, it, it feels like that's been the direction that things have gone um, this offseason. But, yeah, I think Ken Dorsey coming here is a huge deal. First of all, if you look at his track record, he's been an excellent offensive coordinator at it, for the Buffalo Bills. Top five in passing, top five in r- rushing yards. Um, like, you know, he's been a really good offensive coordinator, somebody who – you could say wasn't really justifiably fired um, in Buffalo. Same thing can be said for Jim Schwartz, right? So I love the move. I think that's going to be a great move for this team. I think it puts Deshaun Watson in a position to succeed and play his type of football more so than what he's been asked to do the last couple of years. And I think this is a great sign when it comes to Kevin Stefanski and his ability to lead this team long term that he was able to put his own preferences aside and, you know, kind of work with somebody who is working from a new mold that he's used to, right? Kevin Stefanski is a pretty ground up Kubiak guy. He learned the Kubiak system. That's where he spent most of his NFL career in. What Ken Dorsey does is very different than what he he's learned. And I think that willingness to learn from somebody else is a reflection of somebody who could be a great head coach and continue to be a great head coach. Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage and I can step aside, take another time out. Other side of the break, back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Sports for CLE will be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward, back to learning new things, back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns with Quincy Carrier from Untitled, Unfiltered Browns coverage. Let's head back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Hey, fellas. In terms of keeping all these quarterbacks, could the Browns consider giving Tyler Huntley a roster spot using him as a gadget player? What I mean is he's an amazing athlete with speed and agility and quickness in the open field. He just happens to be able to pass the football. He reminds me a little bit of Eric Metcalf. Granted, no one can play like he did, but Huntley still could be useful in creating some big plays for us and provide the team with more quarterback insurance at the same time. Thinking outside the box. Go Browns. As always, appreciate uh, all of the voicemails. Quincy, we got to look at Huntley. Um, he's pretty good. You know, he's he wasn't Lamar Jackson, but he ran that offense pretty effectively um, in Lamar's absence the first year. Yeah, Huntley's a quarterback. Like, I, I, you don't put him at wide receiver or running back or something like that. He's a quarterback, um, you know, and I think that's where he should focus his attention on, um, being the third or second string quarterback, depending on how this whole thing works out um, in camp. But, yeah, he, he was pretty good there. He filled in for Lamar. I mean, they made the playoffs with him at the helm um, last year. Well, not last year, two years ago, right? So, yeah, he's a pretty good backup quarterback. I think he is a quarterback, though. I wouldn't really entertain the idea of like moving him out to a gadget position or anything like that. No, but I might put a put a um, some sort of option type thing goal line with him, uh, where he's a quarterback. Yeah, the, the traditional we might use that third quarterback yeah. as a package conversation. Yeah. We did this with Josh Dobbs. Yeah, we did this he, with DTR. Not, we, yeah, but but we, Tyler Huntley better Tyler than Huntley both. Package conversation. He's better than all of them. He. <laughs> We've seen what he can do in the red zone. All right. Um, this is from CBSSports.com. Project, projecting six 2023 playoff teams primed to miss the playoffs in 2024. 
Uh, they go Browns, Cowboys, Rams, Dolphins, Steelers, Buccaneers. On paper, they should be better this year with Watson coming off a lingering shoulder injury. Jerry Judy plugged in alongside Amari Cooper. The defense also remains legit. But Watson has played just 12 games the last two years and hasn't been uh, an above-average passer in four. <laughs> so, uh, so again, I, I guess it's – I just don't like the Browns, so they're one of the teams we're going to say is going to miss the playoffs. <laughs> Did they not make – the, the playoffs last year with like below average quarterback play. Yep. Like was I was I dreaming when that happened last year? Like oh, it's, like if you want to tell me Deshaun Watson was below <laughs> average all last year, which I don't really agree with. I thought he was above average most of the time he was out there. Like pretty much there's one Pittsburgh game where he stunk, but every other game he was pretty much above average. But okay, let's let's live in a world where Deshaun Watson was below average. And I know y'all don't think that P.J. Walker and DTR was playing above average. And you can say maybe Joe Flacco for a couple of games was above average, right? Like, yes, we, we could do that. They won 11 games. They beat the 49ers with P.J. Walker. They beat multiple playoff teams with backup quarterbacks. So if your whole argument is Deshaun Watson bad, he coming back, Brown's going to be bad, you got to provide some evidence that this team is going to be tanked by quarterback play because it wasn't tanked by quarterback play last year. If you acknowledge the reason they weren't tanked by quarterback play was the defense, and you're saying they're going to be better, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? What are, is this wish fulfillment? Th this is CBS Sports. Whoever wrote it says, I don't like Deshaun Watson. The Browns aren't making the playoffs. That's kind of what the theme has been so far. It was like, what's it going to take? What's it going to, the Browns could win the Super Bowl next year. They're like, well, you know, that hangover. They're going to go 6-10. and 10. Like, what's it going to take for people to stop predicting the Browns are going to go 6-10 and 10 when they clearly aren't? <laughs> All right, uh, this is from Dog Pound Daily, ranking the Browns foremost in packful editions of 2024. Uh, number four, Naheem Hines, uh, running back. Number three, Jordan Hicks, um, the linebacker. Number two, running back, Dante Foreman. And number one, Jerry Judy. Um, I'm kind of with you. I, I think more impactful than any of the players are the offensive coaches that are going to – and Kevin Stefanski has said they're going to – they're taking everybody's ideas and trying to come up with what works best. Yeah, yeah. they want to make sure that this offense can be explosive. That's the one thing that this Browns team was missing last year was that even when they could score, they were slow score, right? It was like a lot of like 12 play drives in order to score. It was a lot of slow possessions and slow playing the football. Um, you know, you want to be a Browns team that can explore, be, I mean, explode, be explosive, score quickly, but also take care of the football. Like if Joe Flacco was able to take care of the football, then we're talking about a very different wild card game, right? Because the Browns were pretty much in it until those two pick sixes. So that that's what the Browns wanted. They want to be explosive. They want to be able to attack downfield, put up points, and then have the kind of defense behind them. Um, you know, what you saw in the Arizona game is what the Browns want to be. What you saw in the Tennessee game is what the Browns want to be. What you saw in the second half of the Baltimore game is what the Browns want to be for the rest of this year. Yeah, and again, the pieces are there, so it's up to that offensive coaching staff, and that's why they remade it. You don't get rid of guys after a playoff thing unless you plan changes. Um, so we'll see what the changes are, and I think – Again, I think they were going to do it last year, and, and then Monsoon, Nick Chubb goes bye-bye. You have a good game against Titans, and then Deshaun is banged up. So we'll see. Um, Quincy Carrier and I are going to take one more time out. Other side of the break, we'll talk a little bit about the AFC North and the upcoming draft. Sports for CLE. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as Academic All-Stars and Teachers of the Month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K-12. Is your K-12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the School of the Year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. 
The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns with Quincy Carrier from Untitled, Unfiltered Browns Coverage. Quincy, I know you've done this on your show. Can the Browns win the AFC North in 2024? Best, it's the best division in football. It will be again. It's the best division in football, but what is interesting is last year you really felt the Bengals gearing up for a championship run. You felt the Baltimore Ravens gearing up for a championship run, and you saw that with the Cleveland Browns as they were doing everything they could for a championship run. This year's a little different. You look at what Baltimore's done in free agency, and it's like they pumped the brakes a little bit. Now, they're going to be a competitive team. They're going to be a really good football team, but they didn't make moves this offseason that would put them over the top or necessarily make you think that they're much better than they were last year. Now, again, last year they were the number one seed. That's worth talking about. But you don't feel like that team has really improved or like they're in a true win now scenario with their roster feels like they're kind of slowing down to reload a little bit then you look at the Cincinnati Bengals and a similar things happening they don't know what's going to be the case with Tyler Boyd is he going to come back or not probably not um T Higgins you know are they going to be able to figure out a long-term contract with him is he going to play under the tag or are they going to trade him in a draft we still don't know what the case is with them like while the AFC North is always going to be one of the toughest divisions in the NFL the two teams that have been the major obstacles for the Browns to win the division are in this curious place to where they're not being as aggressive as they've been since 2020. And I think that means that there's an opportunity for the Cleveland Browns because right now you look at AFC North, the one team that's still, you know, getting all the all the things that they need to get that Super Bowl run ready right now is the Cleveland Browns. Now, again, they got to live up to it. Deshaun Watson is a bigger question mark than any of the other quarterbacks when we're talking about Joe Burrow or Lamar Jackson. So they do have that to figure out. But they still do have one of the best defenses in the NFL. They have a solid offensive line. Nick Chubb is coming back off of injury. They have a really good wide receiver room, some good tight ends, and you hope that Deshaun Watson can get back to playing great football like he did in Houston because if that's the case then now you're even with those guys but also you are significantly better from a roster standpoint than those teams so it's going to be interesting to see there is definitely I think an opportunity for the Cleveland Browns and I think if the Browns are wise they should see this as a golden one where it's like hey this is the year where everything's kind of aligning for us like we thought that last year with Baltimore that that was the year where everything kind of lined up for them perfectly I look at some of the the treads on the track right now and I think okay this is a year where things are lining up perfectly for the Cleveland Browns now they just got to take advantage of that kind of positioning all right so uh, we're gonna look at some mock drafts so this is from Pro Football Network uh, Browns mock drafts round two pick 54 they go Malachi Corley wide receiver from Western Kentucky and in round three they have the Browns taking a linebacker junior Colson uh, linebacker from Michigan um, I, I guess I could see Corley if he's there. That's a guy that's yard after the catch. That's they don't have a huge yard. At, you, you got Njoku. They don't have a wide receiver who's eh, as I think through it. Judy's that, but Corley's a bigger bodied wide receiver. Yeah, I, I could see. It. I don't know if Malachi Corley is somebody they covet so heavily that they would take him at fifty four. Um, you know, I, I don't believe that to be the case, but. And also wide receiver in a draft where you might be able to get a solid tackle. You might be able to get a really good guard at 54. I just don't know if it matches up. Like if Malachi Corley's that good of a prospect to him that it outweighs the other good prospects that will be there at different positions. Yeah, Colson, uh, linebacker in, in the third round. I, they have Owusu Koromoa. I could see them trying to get a young guy. I don't know if Colson's that guy necessarily. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, it's, it, there's so much to to figure out before the draft, but yeah, I don't know if linebacker is where they go. 
I, I, I really think that those first two picks the Browns are going to use on offensive linemen because if you look at what's going to happen next year where you're losing Jack Conklin, you might lose Jed Wills as well, um, and then you have open question marks about Wyatt Teller and Joe Batonio as he gets older and older. Um, you know, you're going to have a lot of space to fill in that offensive line, and you don't want to end up like the Baltimore Ravens are right now where they lost three of their five starters on the offensive line next year that could very easily be the Browns and if it is going to be the Browns they want to have bodies back there that they feel good about and that would mean taking some offensive linemen with your top 100 picks this year really want to be surprised if they traded back from 54 just to get another top 100 pick in this year's draft and they would probably spend that on the offensive line all right uh, this one from Field Yates ESPN he only did a, a two-round mock draft he has the Browns taking a running back, Trey Benson. First running back off the board um, is what he has the Browns taken. Um, would have a chance for a massive roll from Jump Street in Cleveland at, as Chubb's availability unclear for the start of the season. Jerome Ford was solid, not spectacular, filling in. Benson, excellent speed, 4-3-9. Uh, forced missed tackles uh, waiting to happen. Shows very good pass game traits as well. The other thing that we know from Jordan Schultz is, or Aaron Wilson actually, Jordan Schultz also reported it though, uh, that Trey Benson has uh, taken one of the top 30 visits with the Browns. So he's also visited with the Cowboys, the Bills, Panthers, um, and the Browns. Pick 54 might be a stretch, although the, the one thing that kind of comes to mind, I think they're looking at pick 54 as a guy they think can be uh, you know, a starter for them at some point. I guess the more I think about it, if if they view Trey Benson as the best running back in this draft or, or a running back that can be a five, four or five year starter, then I could see them taking Trey Benson at 54. I think 54 is a little rich for their blood for, for Trey Benson. I mean, like the last guy they spun a second round pick on was Nick Chubb. <laughs> Look at the prospect that he was coming out of Georgia versus who Trey Benson is. No disrespect to him. Um, but, yeah, I do think there's a chance that they take a Trey Benson if he's available. Again, this is like if they trade back to, like, 65 um, and maybe they pick up a pick at 98 as well as the pick that they have at 85, then I see Trey Benson becoming something that they might do there with their first pick in this draft. And also, you know, you got to remember with the new kickoff rules, we don't know how that's going to change how these teams roster players. Um, it could dramatically shift things to where you keep four or five running backs because they might be useful as not only uh, running backs, but special teams players as far as like tackling and pulling and, and blocking for maybe your returners. So it's going to be interesting to see how some of these smaller changes, right, the hip drop rule and the new kickoff change, changes the roster um, mathematics for the Cleveland Browns because I think, you know, we're kind of relying on what the Browns used to do, but I think that might change with how the rules have changed. All right. Um, you like offensive linemen? We got one for you. Um, BYU offensive tackle. Kingsley Suamatia posts his this picture of him in Cleveland uh, on his Instagram. And uh, we bring him up because perfect draft scenarios for teams without first round picks, according to Pro Football Focus. They have the Browns taking Sua Matia, uh, offensive tackle at 54. Best option would be one of the high upside tackles falling to their spot, giving them a runway to develop him for uh, from the bench while Wills plays out his contract. Kingsley, an impressive athlete, tools to be a high-level starter, work in progress, uh, allowed 13 pressures, earned an 86.1 pass blocking grade last season. Run, his run, bro run blocking was problematic. Um, better be able to run block if you're going to play tackle, even, uh, even in um, Ken, uh, Ken Dorsey's offensive system, though. They, they need to work on that one. Yeah, Kingsley's definitely a developmental prospect. And I think this would be the perfect spot for him to land because the Browns covet players like him. They're going to be moving into a different style of run blocking and a different style of pass blocking with a new offensive line coach and run game coordinator that they've acquired this year. 
Um, and Kingsley, somebody who definitely needs to sit for a year, maybe two, before he's out there. And the Browns are in position to where, hey, look, they can roll with Jet Wills this year, develop Kingsley or somebody like him behind Jet Wills, and maybe even extend Jet Wills for just a year um, because I don't know what his free agency value is going to be. Or like maybe even they want to franchise tag him. I doubt they do that, but they could do something along those lines. Um, to make sure that they have that extra year for Kingsley to develop. I think this would be a great spot for developmental tackle, and Kingsley is that long guy, has some issues with his hands, but all the tools are there to be a really good offensive lineman for this team. I mean, some people are projecting he goes in the mid-20s in the first round, so if he makes it to 54, I think the Browns would be hopping on that. Quincy Carrier, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Quincy. Thank you, Dave. You have a great day. All right, Quincy Carey, make sure you check him out. Uh, always really good brown stuff, uh, untitled, unfiltered uh, coverage. Uh, make sure you check out his show. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. Uh, Jacob Roach from brownswire.com and the Barking Browns podcast straight ahead. We continue talking Browns. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. Play Maximum Millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery, and you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. I am powerful beyond my wildest imagination. I will define my future. I will keep challenging myself to improve. Because I am a future leader of this great nation. I will be responsible for raising a beautiful family. And educating not only my generation, but many more to come. I will make a difference in my community and I will stand up for what I believe in. I will not settle for simply chasing my dreams, I will achieve them. Because I was given a chance. An opportunity. A home. At Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. The ultimate leadership experience. FCCLA has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. It's made me who I am today. Join us, we'll build a new future together. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. This one from Dogs by Nature. Uh, Stefan Diggs trade has four areas of impact for the Browns. Um, the Texans jump up. Obviously, uh, they now have Nico Collins, Tank Dell, um, Dalton Schultz. They got Joe Mixon to go with C.J. Stroud. Uh, the Bills fall back. <laughs> Poor Josh Allen doesn't have much. And you see um, a lot of guys that have left uh, Buffalo. Um, wide receivers in the draft. The Bills will, uh, you would think, will take uh, a wide receiver at 28 and may take one in the second round as well. And Amari Cooper's uh, free agency. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, um, especially that last one, uh, Amari Cooper, what the Browns do relative to free agency. Um, people that cover the, 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 the team closely get a sense um, that they will try to extend him and get an extension done pretty quickly. Let's welcome in Jacob Roach, Brownswire.com, as well as the Barking Browns podcast. Um, Jacob, the Stefan Diggs thing, I, he just wanted out of there. And it, it, I, I've said this the last couple of days, makes you appreciate Amari Cooper. He just catches the ball and does his thing and does I mean, Stefan Diggs worked his way out of uh, out of Minnesota and worked his way out of Buffalo. It's it's really interesting because you know some of the the people that had the anti Kevin Stefanski uh, 
agenda that they pushed, they always point to, well, Stephon Diggs wanted it out of Kevin Stefanski's offense, so we'll never get a true wide receiver one out here. And then all of a sudden he forces his way out of probably, what, the third best quarterback in the NFL in Josh Allen? And all of a sudden he couldn't make it work again there? That's really, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head there, though, because it's like you got Nick Chubb and you got Amari Cooper and you know nothing like that's going to happen. Uh, like what happened with Diggs from either one of those guys, you could just sit back and know that he's just going to take care of business. And it just makes me even more thankful that we do have him on. Well, and here's the thing. When Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Barry talk about being a great teammate, that's code for he's not going to create problems. You know what I mean? He's not going to create yeah. those kind of problems. They can't come out and say that, but that's what they're saying when they talk about being a great teammate. Yeah, it's a guy that finds a way to fix problems, not create extra problems that doesn't need to be there. But, you know, talking about kind of the uh, Buffalo, what in that article about the four things that it kind of affects the Browns, Buffalo is interesting just because I already had them at taking a wide receiver, but maybe this changes the style of wide receiver. Maybe they don't go for like a Troy Franklin and maybe they lean to like a Keon Coleman, but like somebody that can kind of be a number one in a different aspect as opposed to like a complimentary piece to Stefan Diggs. So that really could affect the Browns there. But um, I think this is why there's been stuff floated out that they could go Amari Cooper giving him an extension is because of moves like this. I mean, they just redid Stefan Diggs's contract. He's, mm -hmm. It's a one year deal. He's going to be a free agent after this year. That, that just came out a little bit ago and, you may want to strike now if you want to keep Amari Cooper because that's the guy I want in my organization and I'm not risking looking for something in the draft. So uh, this is um, an interesting thing. This has uh, playoff probabilities from team unit grades from uh, Mike Clay. That's the x-axis. And the y-axis is implied probability, uh, playoff probability via DraftKings. So, I, again, the DraftKings implied probability, playoff probability, the only thing I can figure out is it's the, we don't like the Browns, we don't like Deshaun Watson because they have an above average roster and bad playoff percentage. I'm not quite sure how you reach that. It's, it, there's nothing that you can do logically that that equates. I, I just, I, it's got to be the, yep, yeah, we don't like them, so we're putting them there. It, well, and the funny thing about that is, like, they're the only ones there. Like, I mean, <laughs> there's some teams that are, like, borderline in there, but they're, like, right smack dab in the middle of, like, they're not making the playoffs, but, oh, my God, good roster. And it's like, I get it. The Bengals and the and the Ravens are in this division, and the Bengals will be better with if, if Burrow's back and stays healthy this year. But, like, I get, like, you've got some question marks at quarterback because even with Watson being back, we, we just he hasn't been all that great. But, I mean, Kevin Stefanski showed you last year it doesn't matter who his quarterback is. You know, he'll find a way to make it work, win 10, 11 games, and move on. So, with as good as this roster is, I don't have any logical reasons outside of catastrophic injuries that they would fall where they fell fell on that chart. Yeah, and I get it. You know, the Browns historically haven't been great. Kevin Stefanski has won Coach of the Year twice. They've had two 11-win seasons. Um, the year they didn't have Deshaun Watson, what was it, 7-10, and 8-9 and the year before, they're not 1-31 anymore. I, 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 again, that's in the past, finally. And, and so now they've got to get from – okay, they're a playoff team to their hosting playoff games, winning playoff games, and then you're, you know, you're constantly challenging. But, yeah, that's, that's a, we've had a couple of things today that we're just going to explain as we don't like the Browns, we don't like Deshaun Watson, and uh, okay, we'll, we'll accept that and move on. Um, this from Dog Pound Daily. I found this kind of interesting. Three Browns who could be traded during the NFL draft. Number three, they go with running back Pierre Strong. Um, again, I could see that, a young guy who, who has shown some flashes. Number two, they say David Bell. I, I'm, that one I'm not so sure about. Number one, they say Greg Newsom. I suppose if somebody gave them a lot, they would trade Greg Newsom. 
But I don't think they're going to trade Greg Newsom. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're going to pick up his fifth-year option, and, and they'll figure it out from there, much like they did with Jedrick Wills. Yeah, and, they, and, you know, an interesting point, they did it with Jed and with Jerry Judy once they got him, where they kind of redid that fifth-year option to where the cap hit wasn't something crazy. I can see Greg Newsom if somebody calls and says, give us Newsom in like a fourth or a fifth for a second, like maybe a real premium pick like that. I could see them potentially doing it just because, you know, you're not probably not going to pay him long term. So maybe if you get a real premium pick, you would w be willing to do it. But like now you got to potentially go up against Houston and that three wide receiver monster that they got down there and you kind of might need your corners. And I I'm very back and forth on rather they'll move Newsom or not, but unless it's a real premium pick, they're not going to do it. They've shown they, that these, they know the value of good corners, especially they've got, you know, Newsom and Ward missed time. I mean, they consistently missed some time here and there. So as much as I thought there was a good chance they would trade Newsom going into it, we've gotten to this point, and I don't really think they will unless a premium pick comes on the board or one of these top corners falls to them maybe at 54, and then they move them on. Um, I do think the Pierre Strong one is interesting. Um, it could even be Jerome Ford just from a simple uh you look at all these running backs they're starting to meet with. They met with Trey Benson, the Florida mm -hmm. State guy, who is a, just a fantastic athlete. Um, and they've really been doing some homework on these running backs. And, you know, maybe they find a way to get another day three pick in the future for someone that's on their roster to upgrade it with someone they like better, like maybe Trey Benson. Because Andrew Barry has shown, get him those extra day three picks and he'll turn them into premium wide receivers and pass rushers. Yeah. And the other thing I would say about Newsom. They've shown that their draft picks, when they evaluate them to be really good, they hold on to them. So that's another reason I, I don't think they're going to necessarily trade uh, Greg Newsom. Uh, Jacob Roach from Brownswire.com, Barking Browns podcast. Now I'm going to take one more time out. Other side of the break, we turn our attention to the draft. Uh, Jacob's done a mock draft. We'll go through a couple of rounds of that. Sports for CLE. Be right back. Stay with us. Holy Buckeye. You are looking live at the new number one sports card show in Cleveland. Don't miss the Great Lakes Collectors Convention presented by Gritty Sports Cards, where the passions of sports fans and collectors collide April 5th through the 7th at the Independence Fieldhouse. Hundreds of tables of ball card bliss, card show live theater, celebrity appearances, kid-friendly games, ComC Consignment Center, and so much more. Great cards, great location, great show. For more information, visit GreenySportsCards.com. We continue talking Browns with Jacob Roach from Brownswire.com as well as uh, the Barking Browns podcast. Uh, Jacob, I know you wrote a couple of NFL draft profiles. Let's go through uh, Roman Williams. Uh, what did you like about him? Yeah, so I think he may be up there as one of the most explosive wide receivers in this class. You know, uh, we talk about J.J. McCarthy at Michigan not being asked to do much. That has a lot to do with Roman Wilson not having a ton of production. But when they needed a big play, that's where they were focused on. And he's as explosive and as good of a separator as you're going to get. And he does most of his damage from the slot. And the Browns could use a little bit more uh, slot depth behind Jerry Judy. Uh, I just think he's a pretty good route runner for a guy that just wasn't asked to do much. He, he needs to expand that route tree a little bit. And he's kind of not as great after the catch as a guy that fast and athletic as you would think he should be, which is probably why he could fall to the Browns at 54, but they could use some more vertical speed and, and playmaking. And I think he really fits the bill uh, of the wide receiver type that they, they should be targeting. All right, Central Florida wide receiver Javon Baker. You also uh, did an article and a draft profile on him. Take us through what you found out about Baker. Baker might be one of my favorite route runners in this class. It's kind of a name that I don't think you hear as many people talk about Javon Baker uh, as they do some of these other guys, which is kind of just because this class is just loaded with wide receiver talent. It's all about pick your favorite flavor of ice cream. Do you want to tech, you know, a tech a technician that runs really crisp, really great routes. Well, that's Javon Baker. And I think he's not like a 
freak athlete or anything like that, but he does create really good separation because he just has such great body control to get in and out of his breaks. And he's got the long speed to make it work. So if you're looking for a potential like Amari Cooper, I'm not comparing him to Amari Cooper, but could he take that role a couple years from now as like a technician that just really creates good separation because he understands how to attack zone coverage and run routes that he could learn a lot from Amari Cooper for, you know, somewhere down the line when he's not here anymore. All right. I know uh, on your podcast that you co-host the Barking Browns podcast, um, linebacker prospects that you like to build up that second level. Who are some of them that you, that you like? Junior Colson, number one for me. My my co-host Casey Kinnaman would argue that it's Edrin uh, Cooper from A and M. That's the best one, and he probably has the highest feeling of anybody because he's a real freak athlete from Texas A and M. Just goes all over the field. But with Roman Wilson, I think not Roman Wilson. I'm sorry, Junior Colson from too many Michigan people uh, <laughs> prospects to talk about. But uh, yeah, he, I think he would be such a good compliment to what the Browns already have in JOK. Like he's a really good, a plus athlete that really diagnoses what's happening in front of him. And he has a really quick trigger to attack downhill. And I think he would be really great in like a mop up role with JOK. Like sometimes JOK, when he makes the plays, he, may overrun it or miss the tackle but he kind of forces the running back to freeze in the backfield and a guy like junior colson would just clean that up it's like oh jok stopped him here comes colson plays over tackle for loss moving on with our lives you know but if you're looking for day kind of day three uh like maybe a sleeper i think cedric gray from north carolina really good in coverage uh tackling machine had like Four, almost 400 tackles the last three years. Um, it's just, again, a guy that can play in the middle and that can really hit. Like Cedric Gray is going to hit you. Tommy Eichenberg is a really good day three guy. Same reason he had a down year, but is a really good cleanup guy that really can, you know, old school, going to bring the lumber and lay him out. And I just think a guy like that, um, you know, Colson, Eichenberg, Cedric Gray. I think those are really great options to add next to uh, JOK. All right. So you did a mock draft for Browns Wire. Um, round two, pick 54. You have the Browns going tight end. Jatavion Sanders uh, from Texas. Um, and this guy, he's intriguing. He's an intriguing athlete. I, for whatever reason, I saw a lot of Texas football, and, and he's interesting. Yeah, like, he is – it's so unique in a sense that like he's one of those, Oh, maybe this is kind of a wide receiver and a tight ends body. And he seems like he's still learning some of the intricacies of playing the position, but he's a fantastic player already. Like you're going in there and you put two really nice. He's not on the level of David Njoku in terms of athletes, but he's up there and he really pushed things vertically down the seam from the inside. And, you know, you line him up with Najoku and you know that they that Sanders gets vertical well, it opens these little dump offs to David Najoku who just killed teams last year after the catch. And you bring another athlete and just line him up right there in line. Okay. I mean, and Sanders lines has also done some damage in the slot. He's done some damage out wide. And it's just like they don't have anything at tight end after Najoku. I think Aikens had a down year. I think he's better than what he looked like last year. But there's really nothing committed back there. If you want to kind of really build a great room and not have to spend money because you're spending money elsewhere, use a premium pick. And Jatavian Sanders, I think, is just a really good explosive athlete, uh, big body, strong in contested catch situations, and 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 he does a great job after the catch as well. Yeah, the other thing I'll say, if Watson, when Watson is going well, seam routes to the tight end, they happen and they are killers and backbreakers. All right, round three, pick 85, you have him taking um, an offensive tackle from Kansas, uh, Dominic Pooney. What do you like about him? Dominic Pooney can play all five spots on the offensive line. And I don't think you can undersell things like that, especially with the injuries the Browns had all along the offensive line um was their left guard switch the left tackle um has very much a ton of success as a pass protector he's a okay run blocker 
Uh, doesn't really move people in the run game, but he doesn't get pushed back in the run game either. I think he's probably about an average run blocker. But, you know, when we were when they were down at the Senior Bowl, he played center, he played guard, he played tackle, and he did all three very well. Um, he comes in, let him learn for a little while. He could be your future at left guard uh, when Joel Batonio moves on. Uh, but as a rookie, I think he's capable of stepping in at any of those five spots. Uh, and at least be a really nice uh, pass protector. Um, and and it's just, Andrew Barry has shown how much he likes those uh, versatile linemen. And when you can play five positions, I want you on my football team. And again, you can catch uh, the rest of Jacob's mock draft, brownswire.com. Uh, Jacob Roach, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Jacob. Thanks, Dave. All right, Jacob Roach, make sure you check him out. Uh, really good stuff. Brownswire.com. He is also the co-host of the Barking Browns podcast. Always really good stuff. We appreciate Jacob's time. That's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We will see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLE.